Cool. Well, welcome to the Beyond Cinema Studio, Jan. Yeah, congratulations, mate. This film's had a bit of a journey, yeah. starting with Berlin and Carlo Vivari and now here. How's it feel watching something that's like, you know, obviously political and set in a certain landscape, but watching it with all different audiences all around the world? I think it's, it's been an amazing experience, a humbling experience. I mean, it's very touching at times. I mean, especially showing it in Ireland or and showing it in Colombia, for instance, you know, a country that's had 50 years of civil war and, and, and you know, people sharing anecdotes after the screening. And also, it's almost been like a gap year. I've, been, I've seen so much of the world this year. So, so, you know, I'm incredibly grateful for it, but yeah. Is it weird also? I mean, you make a movie and you may not know it at the time, but you're going to be become an advocate for all those historical perspectives for the next couple of years as you travel around with it. Was that a burden or a challenge that you kind well, of knew going in? Um, well, now you said that's making me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, you know, I wouldn't be, I, I could never call myself an advocate. I'm not a polemicist. That's, like, you know, I'm not educated enough and knowledgeable enough. And that's why I steered the film towards engaging with the shades of grey and um, really just trying to humanise everybody. I spent a lot of time speaking to people that were involved so I could try and, and identify with all the different points of view. And really just, like I say, just trying, our agenda, if you like, was to try and humanise everyone yeah. and capture the sort of tribalism of it or, and the sort of visceral nature of a, a very confusing and, and messy situation. Well, that was something I found interesting about your preparation for this, is that you took the time to go and meet with both sides of the equation over in Northern Ireland. Um, I myself was mm -hmm. there ages ago and did a similar thing and took photos of all the murals, which oh, I wow. found were just so Where, When powerful. did you go? It was 98. Oh wow, okay, yeah, yeah. Around the time they were electing the council. Incredible. It's, the mural, seeing that, it's, quite, it's an incredible experience, isn't it? Yeah, powerful. Yeah, yeah, really powerful. And even the fact that the curbsides are coloured for different areas so that you yeah. know where you are. Yeah, the place has got a serious atmosphere I've never experienced anywhere else. And also the people have a serious sense of humour, a lot of unique sense of humour. I, mean, I love yeah. the, their attitude to it all, you know, but like, yeah, yeah, I mean, you have a responsibility, man. Like, I can't, you know, I'm not Anglo-Saxon, I'm not even... It's not my personal history. I'm born in Paris. I'm half Algerian, half French. You know, who am I to tell this story? So, you can't just exploit a very recent, painful period in people's lives to make a genre picture or just to, to make something you hope will pop. That's like that would be just too cynical. Yeah. So when we were developing it, we had to. It's like a, we had a real. We were really cons concerned, or we should say, diligent, to try and make sure that we identify with people and we we were sort of ethical about it. And yeah. And also, you know, we consulted people. We had, we had a responsibility to do that. But, you know, also we could see it. there was a, there's a sense that the films transcended the specificity of the troubles and had a universality in that you could be talking. I mean, like it spoke to people that had lived through the Civil War in Colombia when I screened it there. It could be about Iraq, you know, it could be set in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria now. It's, it's about a pattern in human behavior as well, yeah. as well as the particular nuances of that conflict. And how we're treating these kids and we're sending them off into different places. Exactly, it's the main thing I engage with, it's children in conflict, yeah. children growing up in conflict, they are in their home cities, yeah. as well as kids that join, often seeking the paternal, seeking a sense of tribe, a sense of home, join the army. They think they found a family and that family is very quick to betray them and sacrifice them sometimes. Well that was what's interesting about Jack, is he could have easily ended up in the army and he kind of speaks about that sometimes. Yeah man, he genuinely wanted to be a football player or join the army, yeah. you know, he's like, he's not faking it, you know, that's like, he's, he f he's got this old school masculinity that's like, you know, he's from that world where, you know, he was genuinely, like I say, going to be a football player or join the army, those are the prospects he was looking at before he stumbled into acting. Yeah. He gets it, he's not, it's not affected. What about you as a kid, what kind of, who... Who oh. gave you the creative license? I was never going to join the army. Actually, I got called up to do military service. I got out of it. <laughs> I, was, I was asked to do military service for the French at 18. I found a way to get out of that. Who so I'm the opposite. Who gave you the... And I was shit at football. <laughs> who, who gave you the, the kind of approval or the um, support that you needed to go up and be a creative? Is that a family member or a teacher? Like, who inspired that? Uh, you know, lots of, uh, lots of different people along the way have been very generous with me and too many to mention like there have been teachers there's always been these people that have just been you know very critical support have given me opportunities my family no one in my family even went to university before you know, my mother works in restaurants she's a cleaner now so five you know so it wasn't like there was someone in my family that did film it's when i was young i was like devoured cinema but to be a filmmaker is like some sort of weird pie in the sky concept i don't have an anecdote of playing with super eight cameras and a 
a train set or anything, do you know what I mean? It's yeah, but they also didn't try and deter you from that. No, absolutely not. The, the thing they were cool about was it, was it was a very open household. You know, we were immigrants, mother couldn't speak English. She wanted to watch films in her own language. We had a VHS machine very early on, you know, working class family, but she was watching, she was getting VHS sent from France. So I had this weird, vi varied diet of watching a lot of French movies at a very early age, from the old sort of broad Belmondo movies to Truffaut movies to Godard movies to, and then I'd be devouring, you know, things like The Warriors about 50 times and, you know, and Carpenter movies. And I kind of had a weird kind of varied diet, but I was exposed to, and a very open-minded household. So. In that respect, I was very supported by my family because yeah. there was a sense of like, you know, you can do whatever you want to do. You can, you know, and we'll support you. There, there, were, there yeah. were no expectations or anything. Talk to me about the distance of being, maybe it was a comfortable thing of being able to shoot this story that's so obviously Irish outside of Ireland. Did that give it a, a buffer zone of, that made you feel a little bit more protected or was that No, no, a, no. Like, you know, that's like something people might read and online and project onto it. It was purely circumstantial. It was like, it's practical reasons. Northern Irish Screen was supporting the film. I was scouting. When I first came on board, I was like, we, it's, it's a Northern Irish story. We have to shoot it in Northern Ireland. And um, and I started like developing my aesthetic for the film. And the final third of the film, you know, I wanted to, we wanted to change it. We were looking for a way to have a different visual language to what we, to the initial ideas. And anyway, through research, I found a picture of a, a building called the Divis Flats. It was like this amazing piece of brutalist architecture that was on the, on the Lower Falls Road, and it was at the it was like a Republican stronghold, yeah. and unpoliceable. The army used to airdrop people, soldiers in and out on the top floor of one of the tower blocks. It was a proper stronghold, but also it was like an incredible structure. And I was like, wow, I want to set the last set of the film there because it's like the belly of the beast, so to speak. You know, it had these visual metaphors, but also you could you could create a tension, a kind of cat and mouse sequence without, you know, resorting to too much action, if you like. Anyway, the, the, the Divis flats have been knocked down. They were yeah. torn down because they were unpoliceable. So, you know, the, the, the location that became our primary location, that 30 pages, half an hour of the movie would be set in, you couldn't find anywhere in Ireland. And the irony is we found it in the north of England it actually was a problem for us initially because it meant, you know, it was our finance plan would have been better if we had done it in Ireland. Yeah, cool. And also, you know, I didn't want to use anybody, I didn't want to use pe low English talent that can do the Irish accent or a second generation. I wanted, to, I wanted to use people. So what we did, we flew all the cast over from Ireland. So actually, we incurred more costs that way, but we, it was purely about locations. Yeah, there were a lot of, um, talk about the support, there were a lot of kind of countries, different finances that came into play. Um, Studio Canal, BFI, Screen Ireland. Um, how was that? Was that it's all, you it's, had to it's all technically or? UK money. Yeah. You know, uh, Northern Irish Screen, Screen Scotland, like you say. Studio Canal was the UK end of the French part, didn't take it. Yeah. There's Danny Perkins at, at and Dan McRae at Studio Canal, Lizzie Frankie at BFI, Tess, the wonderful Tessa Ross, so, uh, you know, wonderful Lizzie Frankie, Tessa Ross at Film 4. These are the people that like really supported the film. Without them, it couldn't exist because we couldn't get a single pre-sale for the movie. You couldn't raise money for this on foreign sales. This, you know, no one, on paper, everyone was like, this film shouldn't exist. No one, no one was and interested. Jack, and Jack wasn't a star yet. No, and Jack wasn't a star. No one knows who I am. Yeah. No one knows, it was like, you know, people money balled the equation and was like, nah. <laughs> you didn't Pass. show them the lookbook? <laughs> I was there with my lookbook, pitching bits. <laughs> no, it was, uh, it didn't, it didn't, um, it didn't add up for people. And fair enough, you know, and it's incredible. Like, I remember when we were in prep and in the thick of it and in Belfast and when it was looking hellish and it looked like this thing would never work out. Uh, and me and the producer, Angus, Angus Lambert, who, who initially had the idea, yeah. we'd be sitting in a bar and we sort of looked at each other one night going, I bet no one even sees the film. <laughs> and then, you know, a year later, it's incredible to be here at Sundance and we've traveled with the film and actually, it's been this, this journey we could never see coming. Well, congratulations on the success so far and, and many more. Cheers, mate. Yeah, appreciate All right. it. All right, cool, Thanks, man. Though. Take care.